सतो मा सद्गमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्युर्मा अमृत गमय ओ शाति 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 ओम लीड अस फ्रॉम दि अनरियल टू द रियल लीड अस फ्रॉम डार्कनेस अन टू लाइट लीड अस फ्रॉम डेथ टू इमोटैलिटी ओम पीस 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 गुड मॉर्निंग एंड नमस्ते एवरीबडी all of ashtavakra is basically it's saying one thing about our reality which is already present and already evident shining forth and these words are like a pointer ashtavakra's words can should be taken as a pointer not so much as an argument not so much as you know teaching also it's trying to show us something so at any time if you feel it is an exercise in meditation ashtavakra is actually an exercise in non dual meditation any time if you feel like closing your eyes and focusing on what he is trying to point out that's wonderful don't drift off to sleep but even if you do you won't miss anything because when you wake up again it will be the same thing he'll be saying the same thing <laughs> <laughs> then so we'll chant verses 4 and 5 first before going ahead verse 4 देहो न ते देहो देहो न ते देहो भोक्ता कर्ता न वा भवान् भोक्ता कर्ता न वा भवान् चिद्रूपोषी सदा साक्षी चिद्रूपोषी सदा साक्षी निरपेक्ष सुखम चर निरपेक्ष सुखम चर वर्ष फाइव राग द्वेशो मनो धर्म राग द्वेशो मनो धर्म न मनस्ते कदाचन न मनस्ते कदाचन निर्विकल्पोसी बोधात्मा निर्विकल्पोसी बोधात्मा निर्विकार सुखम चर निर्विकार सुखम चर सिक्स वर्ष सर्वूतेषु चात्मानूतेषु चात्मानूता चात्मूता चात्म विज्ञा निरहंकारो निरहंकारो निर्ममस्व सुखी भव निर्ममस्व सुखी भव द सिक्स वर्ष ट्रांसलेशन इज रियलाइजिंग द सेल्फ इन ऑल एंड ऑल इन द सेल्फ फ्री फ्रॉम इगोइजम एंड फ्री फ्रॉम द सेंस ऑफ माइंड बी हैप्पी लेट एस सी वट बायरम हेज ट्रांसलेटेड इट एज <clears throat> for see the self is in all beings and all beings are in the self no you are free free of i free of mine be happy so you are free this is the constant refrain of advaita vedanta that you already are free and recall to my mind long time ago i had seen this uh, cinema on the french revolution and the bastille the, the prisoners are set free so it was it was a comedy actually so and it was one of those old productions you know something like almost like a, a theatrical production on mostly it's set in one stage so whatever is going on this prisoner who's been set free he's crony and uh, uh, sort of ill and shaky but is delighted to be free so in almost every other scene whatever is going on people are talking and discussing serious matters suddenly he runs through the whole scene you know he comes from one side and runs across the stage screaming i am free i am free <laughs> <laughs> yes 
But the real freedom is this freedom from I and mine. This language, Sarva Bhuteshu Chatmanam, Sarva Bhutani Chatmani. The seeing oneself, the self in all beings, and all beings in the self. This expresses the highest realization in Advaita Vedanta. And you find this language in many places. Ashtavakra here, the self in all beings and all beings in the self. You find it in the Isha Upanishad, exactly the same language. You find it in the Bhagavad Gita, the same language. And Swami Vivekananda's The Song of the Sannyasin. The Song of the Sannyasin, which he wrote, uh, the, the final lines of that poem, the last line of the, of the final stanza, the last line is, the all has I become, the I has all become, and the all is I and bliss. The I has all become, and the all is I and bliss. No, thou art that sannyasi bold, say om, that sat om. Exactly the same meaning. The I has all become, and the all is I. This is the final realization. What does this mean? We will try to understand it first, and then we will try to actually experience this. Um, one way of understanding this is, how is it that the self is in all beings? A good way of understanding this is the Advaitic idea of existence, of Sat. I am Sat, I am Brahman. But this existence, you see, if you look around the world, the one common factor that we see in all entities of the world uh, is existence. The final, the most general characteristic is existence. Man is, woman is, chair is, the ground is, building is, sky is, sun is, the moon is, 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 everywhere. Even a num something like an abstract concept, like a number, is, in some sense. Even fictional entities, Harry Potter, is, in a fictional sense, in a fictional universe. There is a sense of isness associated with reality. Reality and isness are the same thing. And this isness is in everything that we experience. Just like all the waves and ripples in that beautiful lake, water is. In the morning, I was sitting there, just had gone out for a little while, and uh, the water was calm. There was no breeze at that time. And the forest on the other side, the woods were reflected in the water. Now, when you look at the water itself, what do you see? You see trees of various um, shapes and hues. You see the bright blue sky, so clear. You see clouds floating by. You see birds flying through, all in the water. Now, the interesting thing is in the water, there are no trees. There are no, the sky is not there in the water. There, the clouds are not there in the water. There's no birds in the water. In fact, what seems so clearly, um, forest, clouds, sky, birds, water, 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 water. Shankaracharya in the Dakshinamurti Stotra, he sings, Vishwam darpana drishyamana nagari tulyam. Nijantar Gatam. Like a city, like a city seen in a mirror. In a mirror, what do you see? You see buildings and roads and people and cars. And yet, what's there in the mirror actually, really? If you touch it, are you going to touch a building, a person, a road or a car? You're just going to touch glass. And yet everything seems different from each other and there's activity going on. There are people, there are things, living and non-living things distinct entities. It's just class. Pashyanatmani mayaya yatha nidraya. It says, this entire universe is like a city seen in a mirror. Now immediately we will say, but wait, wait a minute Swami, before you go ahead. There in the lake, there is a forest outside the lake. 
that's being reflected there. There is a sky above that's being reflected in the lake. There are clouds and birds there which are being reflected in the lake. So there is a real thing outside the lake which is being reflected. That's why Shankaracharya knows immediately what, when we sing like that, we will say, just a minute, there's a city in the mirror, fine, but there's a real city outside which is being reflected in the mirror. It's an example. That's why he knows the way we think. So that's why he says, Nijantar Gatam. It's all inside. Imagine there's no city outside. It only appears in the mirror. They didn't have um, television and monitors and computer screens in those days. Otherwise, he would have used that example. There's nothing outside. It's reflected in the mirror. Imagine there's no forest outside, sky outside, birds, clouds outside. Just in the lake you see all that appearing. Now, that's difficult to imagine in the physical world, but in consciousness it's entirely possible. Whatever appears in consciousness is in consciousness and is nothing other than consciousness. Yasakshat kurute prabodha samaye Swatmanam evadvayam Tasmai Shri Guru Murtaye Namaidam Shri Dakshina Murtaye We chant that. At the time of waking up, you see, when you wake up from a dream, when you wake up from sleep from a dream, what do you realize? You realize, Swatmanam evadvayam It is my non-dual self which appeared as the contents of my dream. What appeared in my dream? People appeared in my dream. Places appeared in my dream. I was also there as a character in my own dream. And actions were going on in my dream. I, had, I also had feelings and emotions in my dream. Fear, anxiety, happiness, pleasure. All of those things were there. But when I woke up, what did I realize? All of those people, places, events, things, they are not different from each other. They don't even exist separately. All of them are non-different, no second reality, apart from I, the dreamer. It's my dreaming mind which appeared in all those multitudinal forms, all those, those multitudes there. There, is no, there was no second reality in my dream apart from me. Apart from the self that is from me, there was no second reality, no second person, no second entity, no second object, living, non-living. Advayam, non-dual. The dreamer is non-dual. You, the dreamer, you are non-dual with respect to everything that you experience in your dream because they are not second entities apart from you. Similarly, saying, consciousness, you, consciousness, are non-dual with respect to everything that you see. Or rather, the other way around. Everything that you experience in consciousness is non-dual. That means it is not a second thing apart from you. The example which is clear in the dream, nobody doubts that. Nobody doubts that. Nobody thinks that I actually went to different places, I met different people, I ate different foods. No. All of it was not a second thing apart from me. I myself appeared as places, people, food, actions. But there was only one reality. Similarly, in this vast universe, there's only one reality. Existence. Isness. And if you trace, if you carefully note the sense of existence, start with things and people, is, 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 very soon you will see the isness is not out there. The isness is your isness. I am and all this is. This isness, this existence, it itself appears as a multitude of beings. The self in all beings. It is existence which is yourself. Who says existence is myself? In Chandogya Upanishad, Shweta Ketu's uh, father, Tat Sat, Sadeva Samya Idamagra, said, existence alone was all this before the variety appeared. And you can see his son must be a teenager who is sort of skeptical about all of this, what his old dad is telling him is so. That existence you are. Don't think you are this young boy. No. That existence you are, which appeared in this entire universe. So this question of existence, a little digression into philosophy, it's the most difficult question. And it has concerned Vedanta from time immemorial, from the time of the Rig Veda onwards, thousands of years ago. Greek philosophers thought about it in the West, but generally this question was 
put aside as too difficult. What is the question? What is existence? What is reality itself? I'm talking about existence apart from existing things. And microphone is an existing thing. A person is an existing thing. Blackboard is an existing thing. But apart from that existence itself, what is it? Why is, what is existence? Why is there anything at all? This question was set aside as too difficult. And, and thinkers, both East and West, became more interested in uh, existing things. You know, let us forget what existence is. It's too difficult. What is reality? Let's forget that. It's too difficult. And there were some philosophers who were um, philosophers of language. They said that this whole thing, existence itself, there's nothing like that. It's just a trick played by language. There are only existing things. Hmm? There's nothing like existence itself. Which is not really, which is just a way of avoiding the whole question, the whole deep question, and it comes to everybody. It could have been nothing is there, but why is anything there at all? That way of avoiding doesn't work. I was so happy to see Michio Kaku, who is a well-known popularizer of science. He's in uh, CUNY in New York, City University of New York. In his latest book, The, um, the God Equation, uh, he, it's, a, it's a very his usual enthusiastic and very clear style. At the end of the book, he starts from Newton and goes to Einstein, then goes to Niels Bohr and quantum, the advent of quantum theory, then comes to his favorite string theory, goes from there to the origin of the universe. He says, it may be there is, this is not just one universe, not, not like that, there might be a multiverse, many, many universes. And then goes to, you know, beyond that, how from um, apparent nothingness, which he calls a, uh, like a quantum form, in which from apparent nothingness, matter, you know, particles, uh, electrons and anti-electrons, like uh, uh, particles and antiparticles, matter and antimatter are sort of bubbling up, cancelling each other out, going back into that st quantum state, uh, and uh, then, he says one universe is, sometimes it does not go back. It comes up as a little bubble from that and then expands into this particular universe. Fine, he says that is the cutting edge understanding of, in, in cosmology. Uh, this is something beyond the Big Bang also. Why even Big Bang? Because of this. But then he says, but even that, and we have no way of proving it right now, it is predicted by equations by mathematics. Uh, but even that, why does even that exist? Yes, this universe may be a part of a multiverse. But why does the multiverse exist? All of that may have originated from almost nothing in the state of the quantum form. But that's also something, it's not literally nothing. So why does that exist? He says, and he says, that, that, that's, at this point we do not know really. We, we cannot answer, maybe it's beyond the capacity of physics. Anyway, one philosopher who thought about it was Martin Heidegger. He's one of the most powerful minds in the 20th century. He is not popular, and those who have studied philosophy would be a little uneasy for me from bringing, bringing it up, because he was a Nazi. He was in Germany, brilliant man, but it just goes to show a person may be brilliant, but also a very fallible, very a weak individual. Uh, in fact, another reason why he's disliked is another very great philosopher, Hannah Arendt, who came to this country from Germany. Uh, she was a leading philosopher of the 20th century. If you know the phrase, the banality of evil, she coined that phrase. She attended the trial of uh, Eichmann, the, the Nazi war criminal, and she coined that phrase, the banality of evil. Anyway, she was uh, Martin Heidegger's student in Germany. And she was Jewish. She got into trouble with the Nazis, uh, and she was arrested. And uh, he was in good standing with the Nazis, because he was himself a party, um, party member. He didn't lift a single finger to help her. He didn't want to compromise his position with the Nazis. So, that, so that's the negative dark side of him. But we'll just take up one idea from him. It's one of the opening chapters to his introduction to metaphysics. Heidegger. 
he really took up the question of existence. What is existence itself? And he says, this existence, the question of existence is the most fundamental question in all of human thought, in science, philosophy, whatever you think about. The deepest question is, what is reality? What is existence? What is isness? And he says, this is the widest question, deepest question, and the most fundamental question. Three, widest, deepest, most fundamental question. I mean, I, I'm sharing this with you because I really liked his analysis. Uh, it, it's so wonderfully Vedantic. And um, there have been actually books written on Shankara and Heidegger. Uh, so, the widest question. The question of existence is the widest question. Widest means it includes everything. After all, whatever is, is existing. So when you ask what is existence, so when you ask a question about um, what is a liquid, then every liquid thing is included. Your lemonade is included, the water there is included, soda is included, everything, the liquid nitrogen is included, everything is included, in, but solids are excluded. Gases are excluded. If you ask what is life, you're talking about every living being, but you're then excluding non-living things. But you're asking what is existence, then you're asking about everything. What is not included in existence? One might say, ah, just a minute. Non-existence is not included in existence. But non-existence does not exist. <laughs> <laughs> so you need not bother about it. Though our ancient Nayaikas might have something to say about it. Yeah. For them, they were seriously considered, they were seriously interested in the question of non-existence. But anyway, we will not go into that now. And they thought about what is non-existence? And what is the non-existence of non-existence? Is that an existence? <laughs> yes, yes, double negative, so anyway, we will not go into that. So it's the widest question. It includes every question in physics, chemistry, in biology, in, in um, physiology, in life, psychology, economics, whatever is there is all included in this question, what is existence? It is the deepest question. What do I mean by deep question? So it's like this. Um, when you consider you know, our thoughts and feelings, it's psychology. But then somebody will reduce it. Psychology is nothing but brain science. Somebody will reduce brain science to brain science is nothing but you know, physiology. Its brain is part of your body and so the physiology of the body, ultimately you have to understand in terms of body. But body is nothing but, but you know, life, biology. Physiology is nothing but biology. And biology, if you reduce it further, is nothing but chemistry, you know, biochemistry. And biochemistry is nothing but, you know, just chemistry itself. Organic, inorganic, all of that taken together is chemistry. You go deeper. Chemistry is nothing but physics. It's made of matter, it's, it's um, particles, atoms and you know, the subatomic particles, um, you know, protons, neutrons, electrons, and you go further down, quarks and so on and so forth. Um, the philosopher Arindam Chakravarti calls this nothing buttery. <laughs> nothing buttery, <laughs> nothing but, nothing but, nothing but. So deeper and deeper. And you go finally down, what is the deepest thing you can get? Existence. Even the smallest, the quarks, the tiniest particles you can think of, or super strings, exist. So existence is the deepest question. Widest question, deepest question. Then Heidegger says, this question of existence is the most fundamental question. This is a subtle point. What do you mean by fundamental questions? Usually questions are about something else. So the scientist who is studying, say, coronavirus, is interested in the coronavirus, he's not interested in himself. Scientist who's studying mathematics is interested in calculus, not interested in himself. But the most fundamental questions are which also include themselves. And this is called self-reference. And it leads to interesting paradoxes in, um, you know, in, in logic. Self-reference. The question of existence is the most fundamental question because the question itself exists or not. It exists. 
among all the existing things is one thing called the question about existence. So that also is included in the question. When you ask what is existence, you are asking about that question itself. You are asking about the questionnaire also. I am asking. I also am an existing entity. So I am asking about myself. So this is a self-referential question also. So Heidegger says it is the widest question, deepest question and the most the fundamental question. What is existence? Isness. I've earlier mentioned that book, very nice book, Jim Holt, Why Does the World Exist? A very beautiful book. He goes around asking uh, scientists, people like Roger Penrose and other mathematicians, philosophers, theologians, uh, computer scientists, uh, what is existence? And why does anything exist at all? And he collects those answers. It's worth reading. It's a tough book, but very nicely written. Uh, so. Uh, he collects all the possible answers there. Jim Holt. In one place, I was thinking, waiting to see if he does mention Vedanta at all. <laughs> Towards the end of the book, there is this, he meets uh, one of the leading American philosophers who has passed on since, Robert Nozick. Robert Nozick. And Robert Nozick says, each of these quest answers are fallible. I mean, they are, there's some problem with each of the answers. And then, you know, he, in that interview, he says, you know, the ancient Indians used to say, Atman is Brahman. Your indubitable existence, I am, that is the existence of the entire universe. Maybe they are right. <laughs> so that's the only mention of Advaita Vedanta in that, in that book. But that's what we are talking about, the crazy idea that Atman is Brahman. So this, what is this? the self in all beings, like the water in all waves, like uh, the gold in all the ornaments, the clay in all the pots, uh, the, in the morning that lake which I saw, there I saw the, the trees and the sky and the clouds and the birds, everything in that, it's only water. In the same way, all this vast universe is existence and existence only. What about all of this difference? They are appearances, just like the reflection in the, just like what I saw in the lake. The names and forms and activities. In Sanskrit, Nama, Rupa, Vyavahara. They have no substantial existence of their own. Substantial existence belongs to existence itself. Tattvamasi, that existence you are. And we'll see how to actually intuitively feel this. We'll see very soon. This is the meaning of the self in all beings. The same meaning is, if you can reverse it, all beings in the self. I am in all beings. All being, I means existence, sat. I am in all beings as their very existence. Just like all the beings in my dream, I am in all of them as the dreaming mind. As the water is in the tree, sky, birds and clouds, as water although it appears totally different. It, it appears like a multitude of things, but they are not different. They are in a sense, they are water only. It appears like that. Now the other way around. All beings are in me. We can bring in the, the Advaitic idea of chit, consciousness itself. That all beings are in consciousness and there's nothing other than consciousness. Every bit of it, this enormous universe, which seems to be a physical, external, gross, solid existence outside. And I seem to be a little spark of awareness watching all, watching all of this. Advaita reverses it. All of this is nothing but I, the awareness. To do this, what I'll do is, I'll borrow something which I heard from the current Shankaracharya of Puri in one of the talks. See, these they express a lot in maybe one sentence. You know, and that has to be unpacked. How this entire universe, you start with this universe and you end up with consciousness only, awareness only. How do you do that? He does it in seven stages, which we will walk through now. The seven stages, he does it in one sentence, but uh, then you need somebody to unpack it. What does it mean? It's, it's amazing what he said. 
So they, they sort of pour their entire lifetimes learning into that expression. And that lifetimes learning is not one lifetime. It goes back thousands of years to the Advaita tradition and back to the Upanishadic tradition. So what are we going to do now? In order to understand all beings are in me, in consciousness, we were, we're going to start with all beings. We're going to start with the universe as we see it, common sense. And in seven steps, we are going to go back and see it's nothing but consciousness. Right now, though it appears like this. Start with universe. Jagat. Jagat means this solid world out there. No philosophy. The common sense way of looking at this universe. And then, so that's step one. Jagat. Jagat means universe. What universe? The way we see it. The second step, he says, Pancha Bhuta Vilasa. It's the play of five elements. It is earth and water and fire and air and, uh, and space. Or if you, would, if you want it, it, it is this, uh, all the elements of the periodic table. I was just remembering that Michio Kaku in his book, uh, he says, see how this understanding of super strings from there it, it explains, from that it explains all the, the quarks. Yeah. It explains all the subatomic particles, then the atomic particles, then the entire um, uh, periodic table emerges as symphonies from these super strings. So he, it's very uh, nice the way he explains it. All of it is ultimately nothing but matter, energy, time, space. Put it this way. He uses the term Pancha Bhuta Vilasa, the old cosmology, material universe, it can be reduced to matter. And nothing but uh, all the people and animals and birds and plants and rocks and rivers and dust, mountains, all of that is just five elements. It's the play of five elements. In fact, in one place in Panchadashi, it says that if you can regard everything as the play of five elements, most of your sorrows will go away at that point. <laughs> All our anxieties, annoyances, petty grievances, fears, what will happen? Even death. What is death? Even after the death of the physical body, the five elements continue. The, all, earlier they were together in this body, as a living body. Now they have, come, they have floated away into, back into nature. So yes. It, um, Swami Vivekananda says, that matter, these, what are our bodies? They're like whirlpools in a river of matter. Some of the water collects and goes round and round in the whirlpool for some time, and then it dissipates again and flows on in the river. That's what this body is. That's all, nothing more than that. Play of five elements, pancha bhuta vilasa. And up to this point, science is with you. Science would be very happy. <laughs> this is classic materialistic reduction, reductionism. Nothing but this. But the next part is very interesting. He says, but what is the play of five elements? Maya vilasa. The five elements, so here he takes the help of the Upanishads. But I'll, we'll, go, we'll see how it looks like from modern science. Five elements are nothing but Maya. What does he mean? In the Taittiriya Upanishad, from Brahman, from the Atman, through Maya, tasmad va etasat, etasmad atmana, akasha sambhuta, from this Atman, from Satchidananda, space emerged. Because of Maya. Because of Maya, Satchidananda appeared as space. Akashad Vayu, Vayo Ragni, Adbhya Prithivi. So from space comes um, air, and from air, fire, from fire, water, uh, from water, earth, the old cosmology. Now one might say, all right, so all of that is nothing but Maya. Maya appears in these forms. At this point, one might say, but you're now going beyond science. This, uh, how do we understand this from a modern perspective? If we look at science as it is now, um, it's not so strange. If you, uh, I mentioned this earlier, Rebecca Goldstein's book on Godel, so in the introduction, she, she says, just look at the greatest discoveries of science in the 20th century. And look at the names. Einstein's relativity. Heisenberg's uncertainty. 
good else, incompleteness. Relativity, uncertainty, incompleteness. Maya. This is, this is how Maya is described in. No, but what it means is this, that um, Rebecca Goldstein, she, she says this. In the 19th century, up to the 19th century, scientists were very confident. They were confident of completing their fields. Biology will be complete, chemistry will be understood completely, and physics will be complete. We will have a total description of the universe very soon. That was the idea. So if you had asked a physicist in 18th century, 19th century, what kind of theory would you expect finally, maybe in 100 years in the 20th century? They would not say theory of relativity. They would have said it was something like theory of absoluteness. Not theory of incompleteness, a theory of uh, um, completeness. In fact, one mathematician had a program to complete mathematics. I forget his name. He set out a program in a congress of mathematics, in, I think in, France, in Paris, Hilbert, I think. Uh, those who have done pure mathematics, they know. And that was frustrated because of Godel, who came along and showed that it can't be done. They did expected completeness, absoluteness, not uncertainty, certainty. But the deeper understanding of nature became relativity, um, uncertainty, and incompleteness. The Michio Kaku says that when the, when the subatomic particles were further investigated, the neutrons and protons and electrons into quarks, and a veritable array of particles opened up. Almost every other year, some physicists were getting the Nobel Prize every year almost for discovering a new particle. Again, another particle, another particle. <laughs> so, one physicist said, and they had to classify all of these. This is a zoo of particles. He said, if I, if I had known this, I would have become a biologist. <laughs> you, know, class, you remember class, <laughs> the classification we had to memorize as kids? Who expected? We, they were expecting unification, not so much variety. Why this is happening, this paradox at the heart of nature, this difficulty of understanding it at the most fundamental level, why this is happening, somebody said, forget the hard problem of consciousness, look at the hard problem of matter. As we are investigating matter, what is matter seems to be disappearing before our very eyes. It is becoming mathematics. So, the philosopher Slavoj Zizek, so he's this crazy guy in philosophy, but he has this joke which I enjoyed very much. He said, when you look at modern physics, um, particle physics, the sense you get is that God is playing a joke on us. What God was doing was that God was um, Programming the universe, you can imagine, like programming a game. Now he said, those who have played video games, you know that when you navigate a video game, there are certain areas where you're not supposed to go. I mean, it's not part of the game. Suppose you're moving in a forest and the one uh, uh, forest is, you know, trees are there. You go towards that tree, let me see what's behind that tree. In the game, you cannot go any further. You'll hit a blank because the programmer has not programmed anything more there. It's because it's not part of the story. Now God was programming the universe, when the <laughs> universe was made, he was programming it as, you know, here is a world and you can reduce it to uh, particles, into molecules and atoms, into atoms further into nuclear, um, uh, into nucleus and the electrons and nucleus further into protons and neutrons. And then you can have quarks maybe, and then God thought, these people, human beings, you know, will create, their intelligence won't go any further than that. <laughs> let it be. So God was a lazy programmer. He said, let it be. I won't program anything further. It's a deception anyway. It's a video game anyway. So Now he, Zizek says, God underestimated us. <laughs> we have reached that limit. And like fools, we think this is a reality. We're trying to find out what is the reality behind There's no reality behind it. The more we probe, the more we hit a blankness. <laughs> we hit paradoxes, inconsistencies, peculiarities, because God failed to program any further. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you have to return from there. <laughs> so this is Maya Vilasa. The time, space, matter, energy are the play of Maya. Then, 
they go further. Maya has no existence apart from consciousness, apart from Brahman. It is the power of Brahman. So the play of Maya is the play of consciousness itself, Chid Vilasa. Maya Vilasa is Chid Vilasa. Vedanta Sara. Maya Upahita Chaitanyam is Saguna Brahman. Consciousness with Maya is God in, in uh, Advaita Vedanta. So the play of Maya is basically it's the power of God. So it is the play of God, it's the play of consciousness. Maya Vilasa is Chid Vilasa. Okay, what is this Chid Vilasa? The play of consciousness. This universe is the play of consciousness. And many philosophies stop here. Some of the Vaishnava philosophies, they say it is the play of God, Leela. The idea of the universe as play. It's a very beautiful poetic idea. Entire Kashmiri Shaivism. The philosophy is, this is Chid Vilasa. Universe is the play of consciousness. It stops there. We haven't reached Advaita Vedanta yet. This is Jagat, Panchabhuta Vilasa, Maya Vilasa, Chid Vilasa. Fourth. Three, three more stages before we reach Advaita. Panchabhuta Vilasa, then Maya Vilasa, Chid Vilasa, the play of consciousness, the play of Shiva. That is the whole idea of Kashmiri Shaivism. Magnificent philosophy. But it stops, actually it stops far short of Advaita Vedanta. Somebody asked me in Santa Barbara, so if you like Kashmiri Shaivism so much, then why are you following Advaita Vedanta? I said, my objection to Kashmiri Shaivism is it stops far short of what Advaita wants to say. What's the problem, if you call it a play of consciousness? Can consciousness play? Play implies change. Things appear in consciousness. Just look at your own experience. You, the awareness, the play, the change, the activity, everything goes on in the contents of the universe, in what you experience. But the pure experiencer, you, the awareness, is there any change going on there? Change is in what you experience, not in the experiencer. If there is change, you said, why not? Why, why can't there be change in consciousness? If there is change, do you know it or do you not know it? If you know that change, then it's not consciousness, it's an object of consciousness. If you do not know the change, then why talk about it at all? <laughs> then you can talk about anything. If it's completely unknowable, X, Y, Z, you can talk about anything. So, change in consciousness is not possible. And look at um, your own experience. You will notice, consciousness is pure consciousness. Consciousness is the witness. How can that change? We saw yesterday, it is one continuous light. Even the idea of continuity comes from time. That also appears in consciousness. It is actually timeless. A timeless shining. A timeless presence. That is consciousness. It can't change. But things appear in consciousness. So this is called Chid Vivarta. Whatever appears in consciousness is not different from consciousness. Like whatever appears in that lake is trees, sky, whatever it is, is not different from that lake, from the water. Similarly, whatever appears in consciousness is not different from consciousness. Consciousness itself appears as its contents. This is called Chid Vivarta. Vivarta is when the cause without changing appears as the effect. When the rope without becoming anything else appears by error as a snake. When the desert without becoming anything else appears as water in the oasis. When the sky without becoming anything else appears as blue, as red, as black. Sky doesn't change. Similarly, consciousness without changing appears in a flash as all of this. I said, but you said, uh, First sky and then air and then fire and water and earth. Sequential creation, big bang and then what happened? There are books like that, the first, what? First ten seconds after creation or something, there's a book like that. In millions of a second, what is happening? Holy Mother was asked, so did all this evolve one step after another? She smiled and she said, not really. It all appears together. It appears in a flash. Then we, we put in the stories of evolution and all of that later on. Your dream, when you are walking with your friends or talking and having a cup of coffee, sitting down in a restaurant and you dream, 
Is it that your friend was born, comes from a long and honorable uh, family of people and the whole universe was uh, uh, evolved over billions of years? No, that entire world of dreams appeared in a flash. In consciousness appears the universe. This is called chidvivarta, like a snake in a rope, like the blue color in the sky, like the mi uh, mirage in the desert. It appears in a flash. Chidvivarta. This is a step which only Advaita Vedanta takes. Others don't go here. They stop. Because this makes the entire universe an appearance. But, and like yesterday Bill was reading, Sri Ramakrishna was asked, is the world false? This is what makes the world false, universe false. He says, why should it be false? It is a step, the translation is not quite correct. He said in Bengali, O bicharer katha. It is a step in the process of argumentation, process of reasoning. See, we are still reasoning. We haven't stopped yet. Whatever appears in consciousness, that appearance, what is it? Whatever appears, the tree in the lake, actually what is it? If you try to touch, will you touch leaves and branches and roots? What will you touch? Water. The sky in the lake, will you, your hand move in space if you touch it? What will you touch? It will come away wet, water. And the bird and the leaves, water. Whatever is an appearance in consciousness is nothing but consciousness. Chinmayam. Every bit of this appearance is pervaded by consciousness. Chinmayam. Chinmayam means pervaded by consciousness. It is consciousness itself which is appearing in all these forms. Now, one more step and we are done. What do you mean by pervaded? Is it like pervading means, here is a space, this hall we are sitting in, and if you put incense, it will pervade the whole room. You can smell the fragrance. It's a dark room. Switch on the light, the light will instantly pervade the entire room. Does consciousness pervade the appearance like that? There is a universe and consciousness shines in it and pervades it. Is it like that? No. That water and the uh, trees and the sky and the clouds, they're in that water, the reflection. Is it that there are trees and sky and cloud and the water goes and pervades it somehow, makes it all wet? No. What is the answer? It is only water. There is no pervader-pervaded relationship. It is only water. It is only consciousness. Chin matra. Consciousness only. You alone are there. All beings in you means you alone are there. Chin matram, consciousness only. Now look at the seven stages. Jagat, the universe, take it as it is. Then see that it is nothing but a mass of you know, uh, energy and matter in the stage of time and space. What a beautiful hymn I was reading. The Devi Sukta from the Rig Veda, which is chanted in Durga Puja and all of that, where the Rishi, a woman, 5,000 years ago, the first recorded voice of a woman from 5,000 years ago, the walk. She was the daughter of a Rishi and Rishi herself. She speaks of her enlightenment. She sings of her enlightenment. She identifies with the Divine Mother. What beautiful language. She says, the entirety of the cosmos, matter, energy, the entirety, all the worlds, they are held steady in the matrix of time and space. And time and space are given existence. She says, aham sprishami, because I touch it constantly. What language she is using? It's I am touching this firmament of time and space. And that's why they exist. And because of them, that is the stage on which matter, energy, and the whole cosmos is playing around. By my touch, they exist. So that is Maya Vilasa, the play of Maya. Maya Vilasa is nothing other than Chid Vilasa, the play of consciousness. But the play of consciousness is nothing other than appearance in consciousness, Chid Vivarta. Appearance in consciousness is nothing but pervasion of consciousness. Chinmaya and pervasion, pervasion of consciousness is nothing but pure consciousness itself. Consciousness itself, chin matra, which is you. 
all beings in the self, the self in all beings. Then what? Vijnaya, yes. The seven. Chidvilasa to Chidvivatta to Chinmaya to Chinmatra. The seven. Jagat. Panchabhuta Vilasa, the play of five elements. Then Maya Vilasa, the play of Maya. Chid Vilasa, the play of consciousness. Chid Vivarta, appearance of consciousness. Not that consciousness is an appearance, consciousness is appearing as. Chin Maya, pervasion by consciousness. Chin Matra, consciousness alone. Hmm. It's also a beautiful exercise to go from consciousness alone and back to this world. Try to note it in your own experience. We will see a little later uh, the exercise which we will do now. But before that, Vijnaya nirahankara nirmamastvam sukhi bhava. What do you do with all of this? Realize it. <laughs> it's easier said than done. Vijnaya. How do you do that? We know. Shravana manana nididhyasana. Hear this again and again. Come to the retreats. The Tibetan Buddhists are very nice saying. After teaching the highest Dzogchen, then there are cautions. It is the same reality whether you are meditating or not meditating, he says. It is the same reality whether you are meditating or not meditating. Even then, never give up an opportunity for a meditation retreat. You know, Tibetan Buddhists, they go on long meditation retreats. Even then, never give up an opportunity for a meditation retreat. It is the same reality which you are and your guru is. Even then, never fail to show respect to your guru. It is the same reality whether it is good or evil. Whatever appears, good or evil, it is the same perfect reality. Even then, scrupulously avoid evil and uh, do not forsake any occasion to do good. Some seven such cautions were given. Very beautiful. Vigyaya, Shravana Manana Nididhyasana. Hear of it again and again. Reflect well upon it. And once you have got confidence, clarity, stay with it. Nirahankara Nirmama. Nirahankara, transcend the ego. What does it mean? What is the ego? Very quickly. It's a function of the mind. What are the functions of the mind when you use the word mind in general? First of all, all perceptions, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, they all dump their information in the mind. So one part of the mind is processing. In Sanskrit it is called sankalpa vikalpatmakam manaha. Various options are being weighed, various processes are going on in the mind. Uh, information is coming in, thoughts are coming, um, it's churning away. That is called mind, manas. Uh, specific me meaning of mind. Mind in general, specifically mind is this. Then another function is smriti, memory. Past traces are being recovered. Memories, defective sometimes, sometimes gaps, but Recovered continue. That another function of the mind is memory. Third function of the mind is knowledge, buddhi. Definition, all of this is Vedanta Sada. Nishchayatmika buddhi. Clarity dawns. After the processing, after the memory is recovered, you put it all together, suddenly you say, I get it. I know this person. I understand this mathematical problem. I understand Vedanta. I get it. That is buddhi. That's also a function of the mind. Same mind. Then there is one more function which concerns us, which is ego, ahankara. Why is, this, why is this function there? What's its job? Its job is the manager, the central coordinator. Abhimanatmika antakkarana vritti, that which appropriates to itself all the other functions. Seeing is going on, I see. Tasting is going on, I taste. Likes and dislikes are coming up, I like, I dislike. Remembering is going on. I remember. I, I cannot remember. That's a separate process, but the I makes it its own. And it's necessary. I understand. I forget. I like. I dislike. I want. All this is necessary for the uh, organism to function. The thing to know is, it's not you. The I is not I. That's so paradoxical. That's why in Advaita Vedanta, language breaks down. We identify with the body-mind, but where do we identify with the body-mind? What's the point of contact? Ego. That's why you'll see in every spiritual path, you're concerned with the ego. 
how to overcome the ego. Now, often language is like destroying the ego, going beyond the ego. It's going beyond the ego. The ego will continue. The I will continue even after it, it shuts down when the mind shuts down. It's a function of the mind. When you fall asleep, it shuts down. In samadhi, it shuts down. So the I, you have to see that, uh, that ego is not I. The ego will continue to function even after enlightenment. If the mind functions, if the person brainless after enlightenment, no. Brain will continue to function, mind will continue to function, your liver will continue to function. If every part of the body continues to function, why the ego, poor ego is to be not, not to be functioning? It's just that you don't think you're the ego anymore. You don't see, the, you see that you're not the ego. Nirahankara. But it's very difficult to do it directly. How do you do it? Nirmamaha. It's in the psychology here. It, you have to thin out the ego before you can step back from it. And the way to do it is first attack the mind. Before you attack the I, you have to attack the mind. The mind means this is mine. Uh, these possessions, these people, these achievements, these projects, uh, these um, you know, um, gadgets, the, these memories, these grudges, these unhappinesses, these enemies, they're all mine. None of it is yours. It was say nirmama. And one very good way of it is to acknowledge, acknowledge that it all belongs to the Lord. Belongs to Bhagawan. Nirmama. Then it, you thin out the ego. Once this nirmama is accomplished, I don't have anything. Everything belongs to the Lord. Then what happens is, it's easy, it's almost natural to step back from the eye. You know, this mine are all the bodyguards of the eye. If you can get rid of the mine, then the eye also becomes helpless. And you can see the eye for what it is. And you can step back from it. Nirmama, nirahankara. The philosopher Random Chakravarti says that when you do namaha, salutation, namaha, namaha means I salute. The Sanskrit word namama, he, uh, na, nama, he plays on it and makes it na mama, not mine. What is the meaning of bowing down to God? What is the meaning of namaha, salutations to the deity? I am saying not mine, thine, thine. Everything that I have, everything that I have seen is all thine. This body which is so dear to me, my constant companion is thine. Every constituent of the body belongs to God. Even every thought in this mind, it's God's. Good, bad, whatever it is, let, let it go. Then you can step back from the ego. Sri Ramakrishna gives a much, in his simple homely way, he says, the eye will again crop up, again and again. Let it remain. He said, let the rascal remain as the servant of the Lord. Thak shala dasha mi hoy. Let the rascal remain a servant. See how, how he's distancing himself from the eye. It is something and it has a tendency to trap you. Then the ego becomes egotism. That I am this. Then all its projects will become my projects then. No. Let it remain as the servant of the Lord. That is called ripe ego. In Bengali he said, Paka Ami. That means that will not harm you. Harm you means it will not trap you in this whirlpool again. Trap you means identification. Then what do you do? Sukhi Bhava. Ashtavakra always. Sukham Chara. Move about happily. Live your life happily. Sukhi Bhava. Be happy. Oh, only after all of this. Yes, but also now. Be happy. Swami Smarananda Ji, who is the president of our order, he says one beautiful thing. He says, not only the goal is bliss, the means also must be bliss. Be happy right now. I was reading a psychologist who was at Harvard, Talben, um, I forget his name, Israeli psychologist. He says, any program of self-improvement, it's hard, always hard. Therefore, you must try to make it as rewarding and pleasant as possible. If it is unpleasant, in the long term, you will not hold on to it. It's only exceptional people with exceptional willpower can go through, power through something unpleasant. But for most of us, it's good. So healthy food. If the healthy food can also be tasty, then there's nothing like it. It's like that. All good things in life, if you can, so sattva guna is that which is pleasant and good for you. That is the idea of sattva guna.
Now, how do we practice this? Here is the meditation. We will do a short one, then we'll do a little bit of Q&A. Beautiful verse. Seventh verse. Vishwam spurati yatredam Vishwam spurati yatredam Taranga iva sagare Taranga iva sagare Tattvam eva na sandeha Tattvam eva na sandeha Chinmurte vidjvaro bhava Chinmurte vidjvaro bhava The translation, you are indeed that in which the universe manifests itself like waves on the ocean. O oh, you intelligence, you consciousness, be you free from the fever of the mind. What does Bairam say? In you, it's very beautiful. In you, the worlds arise like waves in the sea. It is true. You are awareness itself. So free yourself from the fever of the world. In you, the worlds arise like waves in the sea. It is true. You are awareness itself. So free yourself from the fever of the world. Now we shall see that it is true. <laughs> so this seventh verse is the conclusion of the seven steps. After you come to Chin Matra, consciousness alone, then you look back, the worlds arise in me. Again, the Devi Suktam, 5,000 years ago, long before, 3,000, 4,000 years before Shankaracharya, this lady Rishi, she sings, the last verse is so beautiful. Ahameva Vatameva Prabhahami Arabhavana Bhuvanani Vishwa. At the beginning of creation, when the worlds of this universe emerged, I blew through it, I blow through it like a breeze, you know, giving it existence and awareness. The worlds originate in me as I <coughs> like Vata Eva, like like a breeze, I, like a breeze, cool breeze blowing through the world. I blow through the universe at the at the dawn of creation, he says, in the first light of creation, Arabhamana Bhuvanani Vishwa. She says, I was there, and I blew through this universe, give, lending it, it became, it became existent because of me. And then even higher, he say, she, say, she goes, she says, and yet, I have nothing to do with any of this. I transcend everything. I remain in, in the trans, she says, the transcendent sky. Paro Deva, transcending heaven and earth. It's very beautiful, transcendent, imminent. Beyond everything and in and through everything. All right. Now sit straight. Gently close the eyes when you feel comfortable. Breathing normally, relax. Breathing normally. What is my awareness now? That here I am, seated on this chair. Feel the chair beneath you, the ground beneath your feet. The temperature of the air around you. The vague notion of other people around you. And a vast world out there the beautiful lake and the bright blue sky, the vast world and this vast universe stretching out in all directions. I experience this universe. And yet, in a few short hours, when I fall asleep, this whole universe will disappear from my awareness this body too will disappear from my awareness. 
my identity as this person will disappear from my awareness and to be replaced by a dream universe. I'll be there in the dream universe as a person experiencing various things, good and bad. And that too will disappear in a few short, in a short while to be replaced by a uniform blankness of deep sleep. And again the waking world will appear I will wake up and sit up in my bed, look around, here is the same world, here is the body. In this way, waking, dreaming and deep sleep come and go, they rotate endlessly in me the awareness. In each there is a waker and there is the world of the waker which I identify myself as. But in dreams equally, there is a person and there is the world of dreams. In deep sleep, they are all merged into one indivisible blankness. No subject, no object. And all of these states, the physical state of the waking, the subtle state of the dream, the causal state of the deep sleep, they come and go, they rotate ceaselessly. In me, the constant awareness. I, awareness, I am limitless like an ocean, a limitless ocean of light in which this samsara is waking, this dreaming, this deep sleep and again waking. This entire samsara which I experience is like a tiny boat in an ocean. I am the ocean. And the person and the samsara of that person, the waking, dreaming and deep sleep, are like a little inconsequential boat floating in me, the ocean of awareness. Sometimes the boat rises, sometimes it falls, sometimes things go well for the samsari, sometimes things go badly for the samsari. I, the ocean, am patient with the boat. It is tiny, and it floats in its own way, guided by its internal laws of causality of karma. I, the ocean, am completely unaffected by it. And lo and behold, the boat is not there. All of the waking, dreaming, deep sleep are nothing but waves in me, the ocean. All the people, all the events, all that has happened in the life of that samsari are just waves in me, the ocean of awareness, the endless ocean of awareness. From time immemorial, waves come up, play around and disappear in me, the ocean of awareness. Bodies and minds appear and are persons People come and go in the life of the samsari. From a child playing in the parent's house to a parent oneself with little children growing up and growing up and going away to old age to the death of the body ending of one wave and the arising of new waves. I am the boundless ocean of, samsa of, of consciousness in which all these little waves of samsara are playing around. Not one person here is different from me. Not one object here is different from me. Not one world here is different from me. Now I go further. The ocean is now a waveless ocean vast mass of luminous awareness without a wave, without movement, still, serene. And in this way, I continue from eternity to eternity. The luminous mass of Brahman, this is my reality.
breathing normally, relaxed. I'll read out to you three verses from another chapter of the Ashtavakra, and you'll see what we just meditated upon. May Ananta Maham Bodho Vishwapota Itastata Brahmati Swanta Vatena Nama Master Sahishnuta. In me, the boundless ocean of awareness. The little boat of this universe of samsara moves hither and thither, impelled by the wind of its own inherent nature. I am not impatient. Mayananta maham bodho jagad vichi swabhavata udetu vastamayatu name vriddhi navakshati in me, the limitless ocean of awareness, let the wave of the world arise or vanish of itself. I neither increase nor decrease thereby. May ananta maham bodho vishwam nama vikalpana ati shanto nirakara eta deva hamasthita in me, the boundless ocean of awareness, is the imagination of the universe. I am completely tranquil and formless. In this way alone do I abide from eternity to eternity. I'm reading Byram's translation. I am the boundless ocean. This way and that, the wind blowing where it will drives the ship of the world. But I am not shaken. I am the unbounded deep in whom the waves of all the worlds naturally rise and fall. But I do not rise or fall. I am the infinite deep in whom all the worlds appear to rise beyond all form, forever still. Even so am I. When you are comfortable, become aware again that you are sitting here in this hall, on this chair, aware of the body, aware of the floor beneath your feet. Attention to the breath. When you are comfortable, gently open your eyes. <clears throat> This is actually the seventh chapter of Ashtavakra, which uh, is called the Boundless Ocean. I'll read out the two other, three other verses which Bhairam has translated. Very beautiful, that I am the Boundless Ocean. He says, fourth verse of the seventh chapter, I am not in the world, the world is not in me. I am pure, I am unbounded. Free from attachment, free from desire, still. Even so am I. Last words. Oh, how wonderful. I am awareness itself, no less. The world is a magic show. But in me, there is nothing to embrace and nothing to turn away.
So now, we take a few questions from here and one or two from the, okay, I'll bring the microphone here. Tell us your name and ask the question, then we'll ask the internet audience. Namaste Swamiji, my name is Kiran. So the ocean of consciousness that we, you just <coughs> talked about, <clears throat> that reminded me of another term I was reading, I came across Chida Kasha. So there is Chitta Kasha, that's the realm of the mind, that's how I understand. But Chida Kasha, does it refer to the infinite nature of Brahman or the detached nature of Brahman? Yes. Akasha means sky. So this limitless consciousness which I am, which we are, uh, has been compared to an ocean, has been compared to space. Sometimes they say that from an Advaitic perspective, if you take the ocean example, that is the Advaitic perspective, Brahman. If you take the sky example, that is the void of uh, Buddhism. Yes, Chid, uh, Chidakasha means the sky of consciousness. Consciousness as sky. Uh, how, how, how did we come to this understanding? Start with the physical sky, space, that is called Bhutakasha, material sky in which the material universe is there. Now, conceive of the mind as a sky. In the mind there are thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, desires, memories, floating around like, sky, like clouds in a sky. So it's a space, mind is a space. That is called chitta kasha. Beyond that, conceive of consciousness as, as a space. Pure consciousness, awareness. That is Chida Akasha. Now we have three, but actually not three. Chida Akasha is the deepest understanding of, of this Akasha. Uh, Bhuta Akasha, start with the material space. But notice immediately, it's not material space in itself. It is your experience of material space. Right now? Right now? So no, without me also space is there, but that's also you are saying that. Imagine you're seeing a space in dream. You're walking around with people and you see space all around. You say, oh, this is space. You think it's, chitta, it's bhuta akasha, material space. But when you wake up, what will it be? Chitta akasha, mental space, because it was imagined in the mind. So this space, you can reduce it to, actually it's in the mind. Literally also. Whether there's an external space or not, what we are experiencing is in the mind. It can't be anything else. Without coming to the mind, you can't experience anything. So what you are experiencing literally is in the mind. It's a great thing to understand. The people you like a lot, people you dislike a lot, all your problems, everything that you think is really a problem when you think they are outside, there is a nasty person outside who is troubling me. But no, that person is you. Literally so, because it's in your mind. There is a story uh, of a great scholar a pundit who one day was very sad and his student came and said, Sir, why are you so morose today? He said, last night in my dream um, an opponent came, another pundit, and engaged me in fierce debate and his arguments were so intelligent, so sharp, they defeated me completely, so I'm sad. <laughs> the student said, but sir, the opponent in your dream was you and all his arguments were your argument because you dreamt it up, right? And then the Pandit says, you are right. He became very happy again. <laughs> the nastiest of persons and the worst of behaviors, what you are actually experiencing which makes you mad is actually in your own mind. You say, but they are the outside. They may or may not be, that's a different question. But what is outside, you are not experiencing it. You are experiencing something in your own mind. No scientist, no psychologist, scientist, cognitive scientist will ever de deny that. What we are experiencing is in our own minds. It is rec if you say it's outside, then at the most you can say it's called representative realism. There is something outside, fine, if I agree to that, but it is constructed in my mind and then it's a representation, a map of the external reality. What you are always seeing is the map. You can't see, directly access reality, if there is any reality outside. There isn't. Even the concept of inside-outside is in your mind. So that is, now the mind itself, second stage, 
every bit of it is appearing only because you are consciousness. It is appearing to consciousness, it is appearing in consciousness, it is nothing but consciousness. It is appearing to you the awareness, in your awareness is nothing but you the awareness. And the awareness is uniform, non-dual, pure, perfect, changeless. That which is you appears as the other. There is no other way of experiencing. Experiencing requires subject-object. It requires consciousness, requires an object. There is no object, so consciousness appears as its own object. You appear as the other. The unchanging appears as the changing. The one appears as the many. Without becoming the many, without becoming changing, without becoming the other, you alone, that is called Chidakasha. Chidakasha, Chittakasha, Bhutakasha. Bhutakasha is nothing but Chittakasha. Chittakasha is nothing but the sky of consciousness. Chidakasha. Tattvamasi, that thou art. One internet question, we'll come back again. Swamiji, several questions trying to compare um, consciousness to existence. Is existence universal while consciousness is limited to living or sentient beings? Are existence and consciousness exactly the same thing? And how to prove that consciousness awareness is the same as existence, not from the first person point, point of view? Hmm. All right, very good question. We know why this question arises. Because in our waking state, consciousness and existence seem to be different. It seems to me there are many things which are existing. And they may be conscious, they may not be conscious. All the people sitting on the chairs, I guess they are conscious. <laughs> the chairs themselves are not conscious, as far as we know. So that's the way I see the world. Therefore, what happens is we have this question of a split between consciousness and existence. Obviously, consciousness exists, otherwise it will be a non-existent consciousness. But the question is, is existence itself conscious or not? Consciousness has to be existent, otherwise how will it be there? But is existence consciousness or not? Or not? And it does not seem to be. There are many things which seem to exist and they are not conscious. It seems like that. In fact, if you go further, the only thing of which you have direct evidence of consciousness is you yourself. Everybody else, you know, what about the other Swami? But you, what are you aware of? You are aware of their bodies, you are aware of their behavior, you are aware of their language. And you impute, we impute consciousness to them. We sort of infer that they must be conscious. It feels consciousness in here, they are also like me, so it must feel conscious in there also. That's how we think. There's no, there's no other way. We have no direct access to anybody's consciousness. We have direct, a telepath will have access to your thoughts, but not to your consciousness. Now, the way to understand this, how do you see that consciousness and um, existence are the same? One good way of understanding this is um, the dream example, the movie example. So dream example, there you see whatever appears to be mind and not mind. So you are being with a mind moving around and looking at chairs, table, sky, earth in your dream. When you wake up, what do you say? It was all mind because mind alone by itself in a dream became living beings, mental beings and non-mental entities. So the mind in itself can do that. It can become, become like that. It can pretend to be mind and not mind. So you find that's dream. This is waking. How do we know that here also the same thing applies? So then for that you have Gaudapada, the second chapter of the Mandukya Karika, the entire argument. How, what he does is, first of all he establishes the dream example and then carefully, uncannily, scarily blurs the difference between dream and waking till them <laughs> you, you feel that they are the same. That's one way of looking at it. Another way is the movie example. In the movie, at the level of the movie, there are men, women, children, plants, animals, and there are non-living things like cars, roads, buildings, earth and sky, and things like that. But they're all what? The light, the pictures. Can there be a fundamental reality which appears here? Now, why this problem comes is, another thing is, consciousness itself is reflected in the mind 
the mind appears conscious when the mind appears conscious the body to which the mind in which the mind is embodied that body also appears conscious and that's what we normally understand by consciousness if you understand come by consciousness mind sensations and the conscious acts like thinking remembering feeling desiring talking walking this is what we normally think this is consciousness when you study consciousness studies what do they study not pure consciousness brahman atman they have no concept of that what they study is our ordinary experience of consciousness so vedanta says this ordinary experience of consciousness is the reflected consciousness so are they two different things pure consciousness reflected consciousness no and they are the same thing it's that pure consciousness alone shining through the body and mind which appears as the reflected consciousness you cannot explain reflected consciousness without that pure consciousness that's why consciousness studies will not end with the brain alone it has to go further just like at night everything is lit up by moonlight but you cannot explain the light in this world without reference to the moon and you cannot explain the light of the moon without reference to the sun which you don't see at all there exactly something like this is happening here uh, so that's why we think consciousness and existence are two different things because the reflected consciousness is available only in places where there is reflected consciousness which means living brains and nervous systems professor uh, massimo who is in the city university of new york he's a philosopher and biologist he strongly argues that consciousness is only a product of the brain he says i'm convinced it's only living brains which have consciousness and not all this you know pure consciousness and all of that no he will, he will not even admit that computers and ai and all can ever be conscious only living brains it says it's just he can't he said i can't prove it but it's just my intuition that it's a property of life consciousness is a property of life in that sense he's right but vedanta will say what is he talking about reflected awareness that's what leads to our intuitive feeling there is only consciousness here and all those things are existing without consciousness but in pure consciousness itself the existence and consciousness are the same thing uh, there's a new word which is being used by some new advaita teachers which i like is this using the term presence when you say presence notice it has two connotations of existence and awareness presence is not just this thing this thing is not a presence it is but you are a presence because you are and you are aware so this awareness existence together you call it a presence there is a presence and this universe basically is a presence you are that presence mm, what else did i want to say here okay we'll leave it here then no so there was a question from the internet audience now from the yes uh, pranam swami ji namaskar yeah my name is shekar so in this spiritual path um as i understand the seeker will come to a point where uh, they have a mental breakthrough intellectual breakthrough like you know, the chinmatra must be true hmm. or you use the expression before a beautiful term you used brahman asti hmm. so from there i understand that you now to make a jump to uh, chinmatra is true or brahman asmi to get to that jump uh, i think thakur also says in gospel one does not need nirvikalpa samadhi and you also mentioned that before in the past but will the seeker need some sahaja samadhi or you know some other milestone to happen or will that practice the sadhana itself will take them to the jump from uh, chinmatra must be true to chinmatra is true thank you i wouldn't quite put it as i am consciousness and consciousness is true as so automatically consciousness is true the truth of everything is certified by consciousness so consciousness uh, cannot be anything but the truth but what you probably mean is i know i make a breakthrough and i know that i am awareness and this awareness is the only reality that there is this breakthrough so that is the limitlessness of awareness notice how ashtavakra keeps saying i am a limitless ocean of awareness 
You know, the thing is, we are awareness in some sense, everybody knows. We may think that I am awareness plus body, but the problem is, we are limited awareness. How are we, that's what we think. How are we limited? I, the awareness, am not that the awareness. That seems to be a different awareness, this seems to be a different awareness. You say that's because of the body, correct, but we feel that. Not only that, not only are there, we feel that there's something other than awareness, I also feel that this awareness is also limited. In the sense, I feel it was born at one time, it's going to die at some time. So I will die, I am the awareness, I will die. I'm limited uh, in space, I'm here, not there. I'm limited in time, only from the date of birth till the date of death of the body, somehow I will go away. Because somehow I feel this body is producing me the awareness. That's the materialistic perspective. So these are the, we feel we are awareness, but we feel we are a limited awareness. What Advaita wants to show us is, you, this awareness you feel you are, that is the unlimited awareness. That itself is Brahman. That's what Advaita wants, is all the struggle is to show that. Atman is Brahman means, you the awareness are Brahman. But to get to that point, you must, we must first disentangle this awareness from body-mind then we will be able to see the limitlessness of this awareness. Limitlessness means there is nothing else apart from this awareness, no second. This awareness is eternal, there is no beginning and end of this awareness, so I am immortal. It is changeless, it cannot be affected by the ups and downs of life, all that we were talking about yesterday. So, um, now, sadhana, practice, nirvikalpa samadhi or whatever, sahaja samadhi, whatever you are saying. Note that none of those sadhanas will make you this limitless awareness. You already are this limitless awareness. So any kind of practice will only have the effect of removing the ignorance, removing the wrong notion of my own limitedness. I feel I'm mortal. I feel I'm only this much. I feel I have got many problems. This wrong notion will be removed by sadhana. If I at all need any sadhana, it's just to remove this long, wrong notion. So purification of mind, samadhi, and all of that. It will just show me my limitlessness, which is already there. If it becomes clear through the Advaitic process of reasoning, very good, you don't need anything else. If it does not become clear, there are still obstacles, we need some help. Then all these practices are welcome. Can we take one more question? from their internet audience, we'll take later. Hmm. Swamiji, further on the same point of, of the requirement for purity of mind, there are multiple questions. Why would the type of movie impact realization of the screen? Why would the clearness of wave affect the realization that wave is just water? What is the need for perfect purity requirement? Can you repeat the first question, first sentence? Why would the type of movie impact realization of the screen? Why would the type of movie impact the realization of the screen? Very good question. It doesn't. In the most horrible movie, in the most beautiful movie, in the funniest of comedies, in the worst of tragedies, everybody knows it's the screen. We have no problem at all. The type of movie does not affect. Yet, if you did not know what the screen is and you get very mixed up with the movie, if it's a very intense kind of movie, you know, it's very difficult to step out of the tragedies of the hero, uh, of the terrible ex excitement of the action taking place you know, and consider that all of this may be an appearance and behind it is the, the com screen completely unaffected by any of this. If we are very involved with what's going on at the level of body-mind in the world, then to step back. We were just discussing yesterday, evolution has designed our minds to notice change. Otherwise you can't survive. A, a animal needs to notice change in the environment. That which is not moving, not changing, is not a threat to you, or not food for you also. But something that is moving and changing can be a tiger stalking you, or it can be a deer which you can hunt and eat, whatever. So this is a crude idea in which but which pointing to the fact that biologically we have evolved to notice change. So something that's perfectly changed this, it's quite possible it will completely, we'll miss it. So we need to calm down. 
we need to purify the instrument in order to notice it. If the instrument mind is caught up too much in change, in suffering, in, uh, in desire, in restlessness, and then difficult to notice the unchanging. But what he said, that's true. Once you make the breakthrough, then no type of movie can block the screen for you. Whatever the type of movie, you will notice it's a screen. All of us, we have seen movies on screen, we know. No type of movie can block us from seeing the screen, if you know what is a screen. If you don't, then the whole problem starts. And we are unfortunately in this category. We need to figure out. Screen in a movie is pretty clear. Water in the lake is pretty clear in the midst of all the reflections, though it looks so vivid and real. But in this world, where is the screen? Where is the water which appears as this, this universe? By the way, all these ideas which I was talking about, reflected consciousness, uh, in consciousness studies we talk about hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, not pure consciousness. And yet it is the pure consciousness alone which is reflected and appears as all of this. I was just thinking, again going back to the Rig Veda, the Devi Suktam. There the Rishi walks, she, she says all of these things. She says, whenever someone sees something, I am there. Whenever someone hears, I am there. Whenever someone breathes, I am there. I am that which shines in and through all of these. It's just all of Advaita Vedanta, Kena Upanishad, which comes later, has not said one thing extra beyond what she said 5,000 years ago. And then she goes on to warn those who lose touch with me, they wither and die. That means they enter into the world of uh, existence and death, you know, live life and death. She says, Taupakshyante. They wither and die. They, they rot away on the wheel of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. After the breakthrough, what is the reason to maintain perfect purity? No reason. It is almost, it is, it is natural. Uh -huh. If after the breakthrough and I realize that I am the limitless existence consciousness bliss, what will I desire? With what desire will I break the rules of morality? With what fear will I break the rules of morality? You see, it is those people who, have en who are enlightened, their lives become the model for uh, morality and ethics for us. We are making an attempt artificially to be good people. We are basically imitating the enlightened one. The enlightened one is good effortlessly, because that's most natural to the enlightened one. But they're not practicing morality as such. Good. I think we have time for lunch now. Yes, we'll, we'll take it up there. Yes. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu